<laughs> and now we're live. Uh, thank you to everyone that is joining us on the call today. Today we're doing something a little bit different. I don't know why I call it a call. That feels kind of antiquated. But anyway, we're on a call and uh, we're doing things a little differently today. This is actually a live Digging Deeper. So the normal pre-recorded episode that you watch will happen live in front of you. We are just going to discuss some topics that we've discussed beforehand that we would like to talk about. But I want everyone here to think of this as a round table. Um, you can interject at any point. You can ask as many questions as you would like. And uh, as long as they are somewhat relevant, uh, we'll, I'll feed them to the panel and we'll discuss them here live. So uh, you kind of get to decide where the conversation goes. Um, we will also be running polls throughout, so feel free to vote in those. You will see the results of the poll. You, however, the actual what you voted for is anonymous, and the questions you ask will be anonymous, unless you'd really like for me to say that you're the one that asked it. Um, I'll keep it anonymous. Uh, so with that being said, Let's go ahead and launch one poll real quick, like. Just launch one real quick. The poll was, what social media platform is most important to your recruiting and marketing? The poll is launched. Which one do you think is the most important, Julie? Well, for our audience, um, that's going to be Facebook for sure, which you would think it would be LinkedIn for B2B, but uh, Facebook ends up getting more leads. Um, yep. But for other groups, that's going to change. Well, so far there's been four votes and 75% have said LinkedIn. Up, oh, it's changing all the time. Six, oh, keeps changing. Up, oh, changed again. Um, this live right. part is really cool. This is good. What would you say, Emily? What would you say is the most important for recruiting yeah, I mean, or I think marketing? To say to echo what Julie was saying, it depends right on who you're trying to reach. So for us, a, a great place to start is always um, on LinkedIn to kind of see what what you can find and who may be connected to whom and all of that. But then you've got um, where you actually are going to get the individuals uh, for the roles, especially in the tech space, uh, driver space, things like that, where you're meeting them where they are versus um, on LinkedIn. So I think there's a combination of things there. Well, interestingly enough, um, so far we've had 13 votes and it's pretty much a battle between LinkedIn and Facebook with LinkedIn holding a slight edge, but it does seem like one person has voted for Instagram. All right, let's get to our ranting and then the audience, feel free to ask as many questions as you want at any time, ask a question. We will pepper it into what we're saying. We will relate it or we'll stop what we're talking about and talk about that. Uh, the first thing I wanted to open the floor up for Julie. Julie has been in marketing for how many years now? 15, 16? Yeah, around there. Okay. Uh, if what? I'm not these, good with dates. Yeah, okay. What this these days, what what is what's a pet peeve of yours? What's what what is uh when it comes to marketing, what are you seeing from not necessarily our clients, but in general in the world of marketing, maybe from our clients that you, is really kind of driving you nuts? So this is something that has bothered me for a long time. It's when people or companies make their marketing content and copy very company focused. So they say, we offer this, we are a family, we have great benefits, we have great features, we have been in business for a long time and we call that we wean all over your copy. Um, no. So if you're, if you're starting a bunch of, of your copy with we, and company name, uh, then you're missing the whole point. It's supposed to be about your audience. It should be about you want this, you need this, you have this problem. So that's just a quick check to look for. But once you once you see that, you notice people are weaving all over their copy. Yeah, it's like, I guess there's a time and place for it, but I, I see all the time where it's like the lead in is something like in business since 1929 or something like that. And I'm thinking, is that really the first thing you want someone to know about you as a company, like that's your lead in is something so self-centric that, that someone's immediately going to turn it off. I mean, people are naturally self-centered. So why not take advantage of that and make your marketing or recruiting or any message focused on the audience? Emily, you got anything that bugs you about that sort of thing? 
Uh, I think for for me, and I you know I focus more a lot on the what comes from marketing it helps us do our job. Um, is 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 it actually helping or hurting us? The fact that we're even marketing at all. Sometimes when when things are just even a little bit off brand, or um, maybe I think when people try to uh, go with the newest and latest thing, and it's not really their core competency or persona, and so it's it feels artificial or forced. Uh, I think those things can be worse than not having marketing potentially at all. Um, and I think that those those types of things are frustrating when you're trying to help somebody with a brand and just saying, hey, like just be authentic, be who you are. And um, I think being you know honest, but also it is like you are both saying, wearing the hat of the person who is the receiver of the message versus the person who is creating the message is really important. You have to think about what are you trying to get out of it? What are you trying to show? And um, it should be that you're a great place to work and, and somebody who cares about the people that are interested in their brand. Not, yeah. Yeah. And by the way, I launched the next poll. It was biggest obstacle to hiring technicians. And mm. the options are budget, shortage of quality technicians, limited recruiting support, inability to reach quality techs, or all of the above. Mm. So far, it's a dead tie between the shortage of quality technicians and all of the above. Um, and we have our first question. Uh, Someone is asking, we are not a huge company, kind of a startup. Uh, Julie, what would you say is the key to a good social media strategy? Um, so I think if you're if you're smaller and you're on social, I would focus on researching the content that your target audience is sharing, because that's going to give not just uh, what they're looking at or the message you want to get across, but look at what they're sharing, because that's how you're going to get extra visibility without extra budget. Um, again, like Emily said, you don't want to just jump on every latest trend. Um, but if you can find helpful, relevant content that your target audience is sharing and create some of that, it's going to give you the biggest reach for uh, your buck. Okay. Um, Unless you're really good at TikTok dances, then you should always do that. <laughs> No, just don't do that. Don't do that. I mean, maybe. I mean, um, this is an example of like when NPR first got on TikTok, uh, they did a lot of really shareable content um, that was really interesting that helped them get wide reach. There's a lot of libraries and bookstores that do that um, where they have people running through and like find a book. They'll say like, find me a book that matches, that's perfect for reading in a forest on a fall day. And they'll like follow them to the bookstore. But so it, it becomes interesting um, ways to engage people in their content in ways that are shareable. And, I mean, if you're great at dancing, maybe you can do that. But All right. We have another question here. Sorry. Had to cut your rants a little short. We got another question. <laughs> what do you think are the most important things to add and make sure to have on a career site, a career website? What are the most important things? All right. Emily, you can go. Okay. So I think the, the biggest thing that is often overlooked is a way for somebody to um, give you their information, it, even if the job that they might currently be looking for isn't available. So some people used to call it talent community. Some people just call it like, hey, uh, I think on some of our sites, it says, don't see what you're looking for. Let us let us con contact you. But I think the barrier to entry and the barrier to uh, being uh, contacted again and opting in needs to be very low and it needs to be easy and, and prominent for people to find so that they're not, for if for whatever reason they don't find it, the link that they want or whatever, they're still allowing you to reach out to them. So they were interested in you in some way, shape or form. So you wanna go ahead and, and concierge service that back to them. So I think that that's one thing I would certainly make sure you had. Yes. Yeah. Um, I will I will add a couple of things because I know if I don't add them, then Kyle is, Jernigan is probably somewhere screaming up and down right now about, <laughs> but. Uh, one thing that's come up in past Digging Deepers um, is that if you're trying to hire for a role that is is has a lot of competition around it from other competitors, as in like other dealerships, other fleets, other uh, shops that are trying to reach technicians, let's use technicians. You have to assume that that person is looking at four to five jobs at a time. Yeah. So you want to think benefits first and not qualifications first. You have to get them interested. There has to be a reason why you want the qualifications there because you don't want to spend your time with people who aren't qualified, but you have to rope them in with the benefits that are going to make you stand out from your competitors first. Yeah. 
Well, David, yeah. I think that one thing on that, right? One of the things that's really important to consider is that it's not a job board. It is your career site. And right. so it is a place where your jobs are, but it is also your chance to say what it's like to be an employee with us and all of the things that are included in that. So yes, your jobs are on there. And if right. that one thing you want to make sure is on your career site is a way to look at jobs that you currently have. But it should also be a full story, including videos, day in the life, benefits, and all those types of things that say, if you work with us, these are all the things that everybody gets to experience as a being right. employee here. <laughs> the other thing is that, uh, and Emily was kind of touching on this, someone comes to your website, they may not be ready. And actually, Kyle was bringing this up again, too. We're just going to talk about Kyle a bunch on this. Uh, <laughs> just patch him in. Yeah. Where's Kyle? Get him in here. Uh, you know, people may be just interested and wanting to talk to a recruiter. So the only way, and Emily was kind of talking about this, the only way to get in touch with you shouldn't be to submit a full application. You okay. should have some option on there of, I mean, ideally you would have a trackable click to call button where they can be connected to a recruiter, but even some sort of short form option where it's like, hey, I just want more information. I'd like to talk to someone. I'd like to schedule a time to talk would be great. The other thing is that if the job board is searchable, if you have a lot of open jobs or maybe you have lots of locations and they're looking for a specific location, having that job board searchable or career website searchable is also a big advantage. Well, and I'd also get strung up by my toes if I did not mention that we have a solution that will solve all of that for you. But we won't go too Julie far has that. Thing, David. Well, go, Julie. Uh, speaking of like click to call, uh, some job boards aren't even mobile friendly yeah. and you think like changing jobs is an emotional decision. And so somebody maybe has a really bad morning. They're on their lunch break. They're going to, and they're looking up jobs on their phone while they're out and they can't even see your jobs because it doesn't work on their phone. That's insane to me. All right. Would you guys like the, uh, I think I can add this to the stage. Let's see what happens if I add this to stage. Oh, mm. cool. There you go. With 54% saying all of the above. How about that? <laughs> all right. Um, Emily, you haven't had a chance to really rant. You have uh, engaged with so many clients for a lot of years on their hiring process and uh, how they bring in talent, how they keep talent. What are you currently seeing that is rubbing you the wrong way? Or you feel like, how are people getting this wrong? Um, I think one of the biggest things is is not understanding the availability in the market that you're in. And so in some places where you can easily say to somebody, listen, we've talked to every uh, Ford certified master mechanic in this geography. And there are reasons that they either are or are not interested in your opportunity. And the people that you might be interested in, you, or, you know, aren't and the ones that you aren't interested in are. So we have to look at your 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 overall mindset about what it is you're trying to hire. And we need to be honest about what we're trying to fill and, and the talent availability. So you can, there's things you can buy, build or borrow talent, right? Those are the things you can do. So you can go to a recruiter and outside and try to, to get them. You can, you know, have a contractor, right? Those are the ways to buy it. You can build, maybe somebody's missing one of your course skill sets and you have to invest in them. That builds loyalty with people when you do that. Right. And then, uh, you know, there's always the borrow, which again is the contract space, but one of the, I think there's that. I think there's also looking at your hiring processes and making sure that you are being honest with yourself. Would you go through your own process if you're a candidate that had three other people that were looking for you in the same market for more money? Would you go to you, right? Or would you're you? You're setting me up for my ramp. You're setting me up for okay. my. And so those are those are two things I think. And then the, I think the third is just um, not being open and honest about your employment brand and your reputation. Like, what can you be doing to help yourself? Um, attract more people. And I think that's where Julie uh, would be able to help you <laughs> help you more than I would, but we, you know, that's part of what we look at. Julie, yeah. you want to tag onto that at all? Yes. So the, the authenticity thing is, is so off putting. It would be like if a, one of the top three consulting firms like McKinsey or BCG started advertising about their great work-life balance. Like it's just going to make everybody laugh. <laughs> Um, so you have to understand what you actually offer and understand that people are going to go read reviews. And if it is the polar opposite of what people are saying, it's it's going to be trash. It's going to be counterproductive. It's going to make everything you do look shady and be very off-putting for people. All right. We got another question, but my lovely support team behind me uh, 
pointed out that I did not really introduce you guys at all. I'm sorry. I'm not used to the live thing. I'm used to queuing up a pre-recorded thing where they put in all the graphics for this. But this is Julie Arsenault, our Senior Vice President of Strategy and Marketing. And this is Emily Gordon, our Senior Vice President of RPO, our partners team. So, And they have a lot of experience in both recruiting and marketing. So I thought you guys would really benefit from hearing from them. But we have another question that I want to get to. What are best practices on hiring hard to fill jobs besides good screening or social media? Speed, 100%. When you find somebody or you think you found somebody, you have to make sure you're going as quickly as possible to uh, get them interested, keep them interested and keep them moving through the process. So speed and communication are going to be the top two for me um, in terms of, you know, if that if it is something where it's difficult, we finally find somebody if you're out to lunch on the golf course, you're taking a day off or whatever, get somebody on your team to contact that person when you find them in real time and say, hey, we're really interested. This is so exciting. How, you know, how can I help you? Do you have any specific questions? Let me get you connected to somebody. Even if it's really kind of a, we're not doing anything yet, but we wanted to let you know, it's acknowledging follow up, follow through and speed are going to be key. Now, I would add, I would just ask the person that asked that question, is it hard to feel because there's so much there's so many other people trying to hire for that role or is it hard to fill because there are the job itself is so unique that mm -hmm. there's not a lot of people out there that fit the qualifications because that would kind of change my answer a little bit so if you want well, to qualify it, that it could ahead, also be uh your offering for the job is not quite on par right that's right and we can help you with that too both both lots of competition and hard to find. Yeah. So when the talent pool is light, right. Or, you know, there, I have a story where we worked with a, um, one of the big three auto dealers and they wanted a complete seat engineer. There were only 36 people in the country that had that skill set, And, you know, we were identifying those people and we knew who they all were. And they were basically between two of the people, two of the big three, and they were right across the street from each other. So you had to be good at both what, what is better and telling the story why is it better to come work here? Or is it the same? It might be the same. And if it's the same, talk about it, right? What do you, you have to find their hot buttons. Again, the speed's going to be important, but also consistency, right? Doing what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. They're looking for everything because they have options when it's a limited talent pool and they may have been burned. They're looking for a reason, find out what that reason is and make sure that your benefit is better. I think also it is, again, you may have to build some of that if the talent. So say you really want a senior certified ASE master Ford technician, right? I'm hot on this one. It's one of those I'm actually working on it right now. Um, and so you really want that, right? Is there an opportunity for you to take the person, the next level down and invest in them? It may not be like the answer may be absolutely not. We can't run our business unless we, we really need somebody who has this skill set. Then you have to look at relocation. You have to look at compensation. You have to, again, build a story so that you are more attracted to somebody and they will consider coming to you. And so when something is hard to fill because the population is low and the talent availability is just low, then you have to be able to look at how you're going to entice somebody to come to you. And when mm -hmm. it is because it's just difficult because it's very competitive, I saw that there was a note about good screening. Good screening is important, but they're screening you as well. So again, you're talking about bias. You need to make sure your interview team is always selling the opportunity, honestly, of course, but also you make sure they don't just say, tell me about you. What are you qualified? I'm not sure. Give me an example. And they're like, okay, you want our job? You have to make them excited about the opportunity that you have. And then I think you have to ask hard questions. What would make you say no to our job? Is there anything I haven't answered for you? Just like candidates used to in a candidate driven application process where the, they know that they have the, you know, the pick of, of the job that they want. You have to, again, ask yourself, would you pick you? And if you wouldn't, let's do some work on it. Test it out. Yeah. All right. Very good, Emily. Julie, Julie we have another question, and I think you will uh, I, I have an opinion that. here. Yeah. Uh, Julie was going to say something, Dave, really quick. Hold well, I, I hate do you I just said I have an opinion. <laughs> huh? I have an opinion on the next question, but I'll wait. Oh, right, did yeah. you, can you see the questions as they come in? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you have an opinion? On the rule of thumb, when it comes to marketing spend as a percentage of total sales, how much does this vary by industry? Um, I do have an opinion. Um, so the rule of thumb for B2B is 10%. For B2E is a little bit different as that's what you're talking about. But for B2C, um, I think 20% is about the lowest you want to go. And the 
industry makes it vary a lot. So like, for instance, Apple back in the day, they've increased some of their um, marketing budget as this percentage of revenue, but it was single digits. Um, whereas Salesforce, when they were in full growth mode, was 70%. So I think it's there's like a rule of thumb of like you want to be in that 10 to 20 percent range. Some people do it a lot less. Some people do it more. Um, but I think the biggest thing is if you have good attribution and attribution will never be perfect. And you need to make sure your stakeholders understand that attribution is an art and not just a science. Um, but if you have attribution, then you should be able to say, here's how much uh, we spent. Here's how much we made from it. Um, if our growth goals are here, then we need to spend that percentage to get that return. So that changes the conversation of like, how much are we spending on marketing into how much do we want to grow? Um, there is a baseline where you need to maintain that to have visibility in the market. But from there, change the conversation to how marketing is helping people grow. Emily, would you like to add to that? I would not. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that question, by the way. Very good question. And keep submitting them. But I think I, I'm doing it for my rant. What's been bugging me lately? It's generally what always has bugged me. And we've talked about this a lot of times. I think we call it secret shopping or something like that. Uh, whatever you do, and I'm sorry, I'm starting to yell. <laughs> whatever you do, whether it's recruiting, marketing, any sort of public communication, I you should have it as part of your process that you go through that entire, whatever it is, the hiring process, the conversion process, the, click on every button, click on every link. You need to take yourself through the process as if you are a potential employee, a potential a prospect, a client, see what it looks like from their perspective. And if anything seems a little confusing to you, it will be 10 times more confusing to someone who doesn't understand your language or how you put it together or anything of that nature. So you want to go through every single thing that you do, click on every link, fill out every form, and not just on a computer, you should do it on a computer. Uh, if we're talking about email, you should do it through multiple email providers because Outlook will treat email marketing way different than Gmail treats email marketing. And you'll also find that things interact differently on Android versus iPhone. And so you should look at everything you do through all of those parameters as an anonymous person and not as from someone within your system. That is so crucial because you can really lose people fast if something doesn't make sense, if they get a 404 error, if they call, if they dial a number and it doesn't go to the right place, man, you're just losing people. And especially in the BDE space, man, if, if you are a technician, let's say we keep using that, but it's the hot topic right now. And you've got four or five people calling you all the time, trying to hire you and you get interested in a job, but you try to call somebody and you go straight to voicemail or heaven forbid, it's the wrong number completely. You've lost them. There's just one quality technician. You're never going to get back. So Secret shop, your hiring process, your marketing campaigns, everything you put out, go through the process. There's well, a, so important. Especially for um, IVR, for BDE, um, when people are calling through those phone menus. Yeah. Um, we've, had, we've seen huge drop off rates once we started implementing better call tracking, where people were missing like 70% of their calls were dropping off during the menu. Like it, it was a lot, which goes to my other rant throughout the entire process when you're asking people to take extra steps that aren't entirely necessary. Like you click through the email to the landing page, to another page, to a form, to then fill out something else and then wait for somebody to call or I call and then I'm going through another menu. Like you're just asking, you're just creating extra places in your funnel for people to drop out. The other rant that I have, and I want you to, I'm going to let you go because I think we got to switch cameras real quick or something. I, Julie, so you're going to take over for a second. The rant okay. of when we say, okay, what's your marketing strategy? And people start talking about platforms instead of like what their actual goal is that they want to accomplish. So you can take that rant and I think we got to switch cameras real quick. Okay. So, uh, 
well, people are like, what is your marketing strategy? And they're like, well, we're doing direct mail. We're going to do some billboards. Uh, we're going to do some Instagram ads. Instead of the thing you have to start with is what is the end result that I want? I want people to apply to work for me. I want quality people to apply to work for me. So what has to happen before that? Well, they have to know who I am. They have to like who I am. And then why should they care? So thinking about it entirely from the standpoint of what is the audience journey? And that becomes your strategy of we understand their pain points. We understand why they are looking for a new job and what they're looking for in a new job. And we're going to provide that content um, that guides them on that journey to get them where they need to be. And like the placement doesn't matter. It's what is your story that you're telling to them and how are you going to take them through that story? Um, so when I hear marketing strategy, that's what I think. Like we're going to a new market. We're going to fill a new role type. We're hiring in a new location. Why do the people we need to reach care and start there? Because then all you're doing is getting that story in front of people in whatever channel ends up being the most effective for that new market. Um, like channels, you can be agnostic to channels because you can switch them out at any time. And as long as you have a consistent, compelling story, you can optimize your campaign endlessly from there. Um, but if your story is crap, it doesn't matter if it's on Instagram reels and stories versus Facebook reels and stories or TikTok. Um, very good, Julie. That's exactly what I would have said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. We got another question. I think this one's for you, Emily. It says, you mentioned trying to find the Ford certified mechanics and you guys asked some questions early about technicians. So clearly you guys are, uh, in the world of hiring technicians, any tips for those hard to find technicians, like specifically certified, I think is what he's asking here. Well, I mean, I think there's a, you have to have a great partner. I would say that'd be my first thing. <laughs> but, um, okay. Great partner. Saying, we're good at it. Um, I think it's about understanding your market, right? You have to, you have to understand who you're up against. Um, I think you can ask a lot of questions of your current staff. If you are uh, somebody who employs other technicians, like, Hey, who do you know? Where'd you come from? Tell me your story. Especially if you have people you like, where did you get them kind of tracing those steps backwards and figuring out where they, they are um, socializing, where they buy tools, where they, um, enhance their skill sets where they get certified. I think all of those things are opportunities um, for you. And I think the other thing is getting your name out there as a, as somebody who they should talk to eat and and refer people to. So again, it goes back to looking at your employment brand um, and do people see you as an employer or just somewhere where they, in this instance, might get their, uh, their mechanic needs met. So you want to make sure that every opportunity you are interacting with your population, your customers, um, as well as um, potential candidates, you're giving them opportunities to know that, hey, we're hiring, we're looking for great people, and then they either will refer somebody or what have you. But I, I think it's that, it's knowing uh, where those types of people hang out, what kind of certifications they get, where they buy tools, um, and then it's having a great story to tell them when and if you get uh, an opportunity to speak with them. Ooh, very good, Emily. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> if I had stars to give out, I wish I had like... I, I, I need I need emojis to like send up or something. I appreciate it. Um, all right. Got another question here. As a solo full stack marketing team, how can I best prioritize my time to define the candidate journey and optimize our recruiting funnel? All right. So solo full stack marketing team, does that mean independent or are you like a one person team? I'm thinking he's saying one person team, but he can clarify if he needs to. I think he means one person team. Okay. Uh, so from there, uh, it's basically the same thing that Emily said about find your best hires and track back from there. Find where you had sales, uh, your biggest sales and track back from there. Um, so you can say, all right, oof, uh, good luck to you. Um, so I would one, um, make sure that your brand is really well-defined, tight, consistent, so you're not having to redo that every time. That'll help you move super fast. Like, you know your core messaging, you know your audience, you know what they care about, and you can apply that in different ways. From there, when we talk about customer journey, I would say they come through that. So if, it, if you are an in-person point of sale, you're like, okay, they're spending money when I get them in the door. 
then your question is tracked back. How do I get them in the door? It might be billboard. It might be direct mail. It might be email. It might be video ads, but find the one thing that you know happened right before. So you can do point of sale um, surveys where you say like, what brought you in here? They're not going to be hundred percent accurate, but you don't have time for that. You can get directionally accurate. Um, if you are doing online sales, it's much easier to track how that's going through. If you are B2B, look at the sales process of what happens before they talk to you. So like for my marketing, the biggest thing that I can do is content. I need compelling, high quality, actually valuable to the end user content. And that's where I prioritize my time. Because if I can start a conversation where I have already provided value before they even come talk to me, that's the best way for me to prioritize my time, not making dancing videos for TikTok. Oh, no. dang it. Cancel our remember, plans, team. Remember remember that one time I got talked into letting people do a Harlem Shake video for the office? Oh, dear. Yes. <laughs> no, everyone was doing it. It was fine. Um. So that, that's how you prioritize. Start at the end and then work your way back from there. It doesn't matter if you have full uh, like retargeting audiences set up across all of your website. If you have all of the tracking code set up perfectly, just start working your way back from that point of sale. Let me ask you to rant a little more, Julie. Uh, when you see our clients' websites or websites in general, because I know you have a background in web design, what? because people are asked about career sites in general and stuff like that. What do you see with people's websites that really bugs you? They tell me absolutely nothing about the company. They are so bland and so personality-less, and they all look the exact same thing. Um, I, I had a mini rant about this the other day where people are like, oh, let's build a website. And like we, I've done a couple of these projects recently, and so we talked through and they're all like, all right, well, let's just see what everybody else is doing in our same space. Oh, I know it gets, gets your goat. Uh, I know. But, what is everybody else doing? What is everybody else doing? And they're like, great. Now I know exactly how to blend in perfectly. Like, because my whole point of marketing is to camouflage my brand in the industry so no one will recognize us. Um, but like what Emily was saying, like you have to understand who you are and what makes you different so that you can put that front and center. Um, so I go to client websites and career sites and they look the exact same as everybody else's and they tell me nothing that is unique about that company um and they say nothing about how they can uniquely help my problems they're doing the same thing of like we have been in business for forever we have this many employees uh we provide end-to-end -end solutions you know i love the word solutions um favorite that's our so, Yes, yes. It's like one stop shop. And I was like, that reminds me of that dog groomer that also had dog food. <laughs> it was like one stop shop. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that, that is a consistent thing. Is they, they start with how can we look exactly like everybody else? Yeah, I think to going back to one of the, the points you made, which is, am I adding value to anyone in any way, shape or form? Right. So when you go back to how's, how do I attract hard to fill skill sets? Find something else to talk to them about that actually is a benefit for them. Then they might refer somebody to you. Same thing with marketing. Same thing with the page, right? Does the page add value in that? It actually helps me do something other than Google, right? I know I can already find out about you, right? So tell me more or entice me or there's some kind of a hook for me to want to look at the next page and the next page of your website, not just the front page as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I've got another question. Uh question for you emily not a question that came in but i was wanting to get you to ramp you've been <laughs> on uh, on a lot of i know you've listened in on a lot of recruiting calls or you know interviews or however you want to talk about them what bugs you the most about how, when you hear people interact with potential uh, employees what bugs you the most I, I think when it is a rapid fire series of questions that um, you're trying to get to the minimum qualifications first um, versus treating treating anybody as the human you would want to be treated as as hi how are you <laughs> how's it going how's your day and I'm not of all of us here I'm not the most chatty uh, warm and fuzzy of all of us right I wouldn't say that but there is some uh, amount of consideration for the time that somebody's taking to have made the phone call or filled out the form to get you to have a phone call with them and finding out why versus getting them to tell you what to everything that you need I think is so important and so I think when people skip right to um, do you have the skills that I need? 
Um, and are you going to be a fit for me versus saying, let me hear what about what you are looking for, maybe why you picked up the phone in the first place, why you considered it. And then let me start to think about how I can be prescriptive or supportive in that versus I've got a job I'm trying to fill. And if you don't fill that, then I'm moving on to the next person. That's the worst thing. All right. Well, we've launched our final poll. We're trying to figure out if people like the new live format better or if they like the original format where we comment on a pre-recorded episode. Um, so far, 100% the new live format. Ooh, how about that? Um, well, if they're I'm, still here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to run this much longer because it was scheduled to go for 30 minutes. So it, I'll give either of you, I'll give each of you a last word on uh, what we've talked about, anything else you'd want to go back to. But if you want to ask one more question before we jump off of here, you're free to. So Emily, why don't you start us off? Last word, kind of summarize what we've talked about a little bit, just uh, leave everybody with a nice little rant before we jump off here. Yeah, I think it's about being authentic, being uh, quick at what you're trying to do and being smart about how you're going to to market with both your brand and your process. All right, and Julie? Mine is print it and put it on your walls. Nobody wants to read marketing copy. Nobody is excited about it. And everybody keeps adding more words to better explain. And all you're doing is making it so no one will ever read it because I just see a big block of text. <laughs> no one wants to read marketing copy. Stop adding more. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. I always say I've written more white papers than I've read. <laughs> So it's like, man, I've spent a lot of time writing stuff down that I know nobody didn't actually read. Well, that was bad grammar. I spent a lot of take two. That's the that's the bad part. Of, whoever's voting for the live format, stop. Because <laughs> I've written a lot of material that I know people haven't read. <laughs> that was good. All right. Well, the new live format is winning. Uh, there's still a few people that prefer the original format, but I don't know what we'll do. We'll see. This was stressful for me being live, having bad grammar in front of all these people. Don't tell my mom. Um, but anyway, we appreciate everybody joining us for this live format. This is actually the end of season three. I don't know if you guys can tell, but the table's not all here. It's because the next time you see us, we'll be at our new studio at our new office and we'll, we'll do a real banger as the kids say. So a banger. What are you shaking your head for? No cap. A banger of an episode. <laughs> I'm turning my camera off. I don't want to <laughs> so this. No cap. Banger of an episode. And we'll be in the new format. So wow. thanks to everyone that joined us. Uh, see you next time. <laughs>